Hello, everyone, and thanks for listening to The Quality Hub, chatting with ISO experts. I'm your host, Xavier Francis, and today we're doing a Best Of podcast, where we'll be listening to numerous past guests and their take on ISO auditing. We will start with Brandon Lowry, and we're going to be talking about the internal audit process. What are the key elements or requirements that organizations need to focus on during an internal audit? Well, when conducting an internal audit, I'm assessing your QMS against the entire standard, correct? Not just certain clauses. Okay. Um, but I will say that a few sections or clauses tend to stick out uh, as the most important to me. And what might those be? So f- first, I would say uh, section four, which is the context of the organization, no matter what standard we're talking about, you have a, a section four context of the organization there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is... For me, the foundation of the QMS, you know, has your organization defined internal and external issues? Have you defined what your key processes are? These are a couple of key deliverables I need to see when I'm doing my internal audit. That makes sense. Next, mm-hmm. I would say 6.2 okay. quality objectives. So, you know, you, you spend all this time building this quality management system and then, uh, you know, managing it day in and day out. But how do you know that it's working or that it's successful? Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you have objectives or goals for how you're looking to perform? Uh, As an auditor, I'm trying to understand what those objectives are. Are they measurable? Uh, How is your QMS doing? And those objectives help in in showing that. Okay. I would say next would be control of documented information, which would be section 7.5. So every organization that's certified to any sort of quality management system standard, you have procedures, you have processes, work instructions, things that you need day-to-day with your job. Yep. uh, We have a ton of those, no matter who you are. (laughs) Yes, exactly. So it's, it's important to understand that, you know, how do I access those documents? Who has access? How is that controlled? How are documents revised? How do you know that you have the correct revision, the most current revision of a yeah, document? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about work instructions, I mean, you want to make sure you have the proper ones that are most up to date. Yes, exactly. So it's one thing that I want to understand is how you're managing that information. And uh, I want to be able to see that change process for that information. I would say last couple to me, uh, I would say section eight operation. Uh, now, there's a lot in there. That's the largest section by far. Okay. Uh, and that's really where the rubber meets the road, right? Uh, This is going to cover how you produce the parts or provide the services that uh, your organization, you know, is is based upon. How do you purchase raw material? How do you design those products? How do you handle parts that you make that are non-conforming or bad, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a lot in there. So I want to see how your organization is, is planning that product and service provision. If I could tie everything together, I would say section 9.3, management review, that really acts as kind of a, a a nice barometer when I'm doing an audit, if I can say that. So okay. the the standard requires the organization to conduct meetings periodically on a on a long list of topics. Mm-hmm. And so during an audit, I want to see that you have uh, those meetings planned out. I can see that there are minutes and 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 discussion minutes available notes that can show me that you covered all those items that you're planning and conducting meetings accordingly. So. If management review in an audit goes really well, that tends to, you know, lead into a nice audit. That's great. Whereas if I see a lot of issues with management review, uh, you know, you don't judge a book by its cover, but it does tend to show some issues in other areas after that too. Generally, if you see the management's really has buy-in and and really works with the management system, the quality management system, or whatever management system they're working on, you're probably going to have it flowing down to where people are doing it every day. It's just part of their job. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Next, we have Joe Hill and Suzanne Strasser and what to expect during a certification audit. Joe, what can we expect during our certification audit? Yeah, so the big moment is here. We're here for the certification audit. Probably taken a few months in building the system, kind of preparing, training the employees, etc. And the certification audit is about to happen. Yes, we got put it all together. Now what? (laughs) <laughs> exactly. So the certification body, uh, their initial audit, they are required to do that audit in two stages. So they'll do a stage one audit and a stage two audit. Will they be on separate days generally? Yes, there is an, an expectation that there is some time frame between the stage one and the stage two audit. Uh, so the stage one audit, it's really just a high level document review. Uh, The auditor is going to ask to look at things like your quality manual, any procedures that you may have written, 
Um, they always ask to look at your most recent management review minutes, as well as your last internal audit reports. So they're, they're checking what we've done at this point. Yep. They're essentially just looking at your documented system uh, to see if it appears that you are ready to go through with the full-blown stage two audit. So if you're not, they put the brakes on and go, you are going to need you to look at this a little bit more before we hit stage two. Yes. Yes, they will indeed. Um, so stage one, it's, it's that preparation. You know, it's kind of seeing if you are prepared uh, to go through that full-blown stage two audit. If the auditor, for some reason, feels that you are not prepared, yes, they will kind of put the brakes on. They'll kind of delay the stage two if it had already been scheduled. They'll say, hey, we have a little bit of work to do before we can come in and do this stage two. So occasionally they will postpone that stage two based on the stage one results. Right. And I know because we really try to go in very prepared for, with our, our uh, customers. So uh, let's say we, you know, we've, got, we've hit with flying colors. They're ready to do the stage two audit. What is that? So the stage two is probably more of what people would think of as an audit. Uh, the stage two, the auditor is really going to dive into your operational processes, uh, speak to employees, requests, uh, records of evidence for various pieces of operations. Um, so this is almost like you're proving it. Yep, you're proving yep. that you're, you should be certified. Yep. The stage two is the, the proof in the pudding that you have the quality system in place and you're in conformance. So, you know, originally the audit was in one fell swoop. So they they didn't have the two-part audit and they'd found that folks weren't really ready. So that's why they actually broke it up. So like Jeff said, the stage one is really about, are you really ready to proceed on to the next step? Well, and that probably saves everybody time totally. and effort. I mean, you know, if you get everything planned out and then you're just not ready, <laughs> you've wasted people's time. And money, and yes, money. yes. This is not an inexpensive endeavor, so let's not spend money yet if we don't have to and we're not ready. Exactly. So we're here. We're sitting in our stage two audit. What is the registrar looking for? The auditor that is in front of us from a registrar body, what are they looking for? Well, ultimately, the registrar is going to be looking for conformance to the given standard uh, for which you are pursuing certification. Now, of course, there are many different standards out there. Uh, right, right. I mean, we're, 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 right now we're talking about quality, which in ISO, that's 9001. You might be looking at 45001. You might be looking at 14001 or, or 27001. That's an information management system. There's standards to so many things, AS, AS 9100, 9120, but we're talking about quality here. Right, right. So each individual standard has its own unique set of requirements and expectations, you know, of course, based on what standard it is. So um, the auditor is looking for conformance against that set of requirements. The registrar is required to assign an auditor who is not only qualified in the standard, but they also need to be qualified in your industry. Uh, right. So depending on what industry you work in, the auditor should have some experience. So manufacturing versus service. But have somebody audit you who has, has worked specifically with manufacturing and and all that type of stuff, they're not necessarily going to audit a service organization. Correct. Even if you look at manufacturing, you can break that down even further as well. So if someone is, is has been in manufacturing, they wouldn't necessarily audit somebody who may be in the food industry. Correct. Yeah. And you can even like metals industry versus plastics versus chemical manufacturers. So there's, there's different industries, different manufacturing principles that apply to whatever that industry might be. So again, the registrar is going to assign an auditor that has experience in whatever industry that the customer is, is working in. In this section, we talk to A.J. Polera from the Registrar NQA and how an auditor evaluates the effectiveness of your quality management system. How do you evaluate the effectiveness of a business's quality management system? There's a couple a couple things with ISO 9001. I know we're going to touch on this, but continuous improvement and the organization's ability to meet customer requirements, expectations, their ability to improve their processes on an ongoing basis and um, achieving their objectives. Mm -hmm. And some of the criteria, objectives 100% need to be defined. You can't achieve an objective if it's not there in front of you. Um, so there's nothing to measure against. Right, right. Monitoring performance using key performance indicators. I know in the ISO world, we're heavy on K KPIs, so they are your friend as well. And these can include uh, customer satisfaction through you know, data taken from surveys, on-time delivery percentage, defect rates, et cetera. Mm -hmm. With these KPIs, 
it doesn't stop there. There needs to be an analysis of, uh, of the data collected and what to do with that. And that kind of flows into internal audits and management review. You know, management review is going to have a focus on, on these KPIs and maybe some findings on the internal audits and corrective action and preventative action responses from these internal audits. And then as, you know, after initial certification, when we have the annual audits, you know, management review is going to include those external corrective actions and preventative actions, root causes and everything that's uh, come up during the audit. Right. Documentation is your friend. And the big thing, continuous improvement, you know, you can take OFIs or or findings and proof each each of the processes. And then we, we try to assign auditors with industry experience. That way, when they start the audit, you don't have to catch them up on your industry and what you do. They already are coming in with that knowledge. And not only that, they may find some best practices that the company wasn't aware of, and they can make suggestions from there, optional suggestions, but they're, they're still best considered best practices. That's great. So basically... The difference when you get into the subsequent audits are more, you're looking for more than just adherence. You're looking that that's actually getting better. Yep. And you had mentioned continuous improvement before, and that is a fundamental principle of ISO. How do you assess that in an organization's commitment to continuously improve? Following what I, what I said earlier, the approach to the effectiveness of the QMS will ultimately lead to continuous improvement because just because of the discipline behind it, Mm -hmm. following the standard and the expectations of, um, of improving the QMS will lead to continuous improvement. Like I said, the, one of the key focus focuses of ISO 9001 is customer satisfaction. So Mm -hmm. using knowledge, evidence gathered through effective monitoring, measuring of processes. The next step is to make improvements to, enhance customer satisfaction that could be to specific products or services you know relating to the customer experience to the methods and resources used whether there's a more efficient supplier to provide resources to mm-hmm. uh, manufacture um, a specific product maybe the quality in their in a supplier's resources has declined and then you source another etc right right so all that's going to show that they've been effective and it's we see continuous improvement and that could and continuous improvement plain and simply could be just to the quality management system itself and then you know review of internal audits and during your management reviews it's key that companies are looking and monitoring the correct things okay this is an opportunity to adjust the system as they see fit it's not a prescription it's more of a blueprint. Let's help you run your business to the best of its ability without changing the changing the essence of how you run your business. So if current customer requirements are being met, are there amendments or things that need to be addressed for future requirements? Are there any areas where okay. the company can be more efficient? You know, perhaps, you know, these have been brought up uh, during the internal audits. Lastly, we're back with Joe Hill and we'll discuss surveillance audits and what auditors look for. Uh, What is the purpose of an ISO surveillance audit and how does that differ from the initial certification and recertification audits? Sure. So before we dive right into surveillance audits, of course, before you get a certificate, uh, the certification body is going to perform their initial certification audit. Mm Mm-hmm more formally known as a stage two audit in the certification world. But it's essentially that initial audit where the auditor is going to cover all of your key processes and all of the associated clauses of the relevant standard for which you are pursuing certification. Once you go through that process, and if there are any nonconformances at the audit, those would be addressed and dealt with through corrective action. But once you go that whole process, you will receive a certificate. Mm -hmm. That certificate is going to be valid for three years. So there's going to be an issue date on that certificate and an expiration date three years later. That's where the surveillance audit comes into play because the certification body is required to monitor your certification by conducting periodic surveillance audits of your management system just to ensure that it's being maintained and that it continues to be in conformance with that relevant standard. So surveillance audits come after your first certification audit and in between your recertification audit three years later. So do they happen yearly? Yes. Surveillance audits typically are conducted at least once every calendar year throughout your certification cycle. 
Yeah, there are situations, there are some customers that actually go on what they call a semi-annual surveillance cycle, and they'll actually have a surveillance audit every six months. Okay. But is that, is that for any specific standards or is that just their choice? It's generally by choice. You know, sometimes there may be situations, you know, based on performance of the audit where the registration body will actually request that the customer go on a semi-annual cycle for a little while, you know, just to have some more more regular visits, um, perhaps if there was an issue, there was some you know, non-conformances they want to keep an eye on. But there's no ISO standards to say you have to do it semi-annual. No, no, it's definitely not a requirement. The requirement is at least once every calendar year, the, the certification body has to conduct what they call a surveillance audit. Got it. Now, unlike the initial audit, Surveillance audits don't generally cover all of your key processes or your entire management system, for that matter. There are certain things that the certification body has to audit every time they're there, and that would include things like your management review meetings, your internal audit program, and the status of any corrective actions from any previous audits that you may have had. Okay. But from an operational standpoint, In most cases, the registrar will audit about half of your key processes at each surveillance audit. Okay. So at your first surveillance audit, which would be the first year following getting your certification, the certification body auditor will, of course, audit your management reviews, internal audits, the status of any previous corrective actions, and then approximately half of your operational processes. Alrighty. Then at the following year's surveillance audit, the auditor will again audit your management review, internal audit program, the status of any previous corrective actions, and then whatever processes were not audited in the first surveillance audit. Alrighty. And then that leads us into that third year. The following year, certification body will conduct what they call a recertification audit. Now, this will be more similar to the initial certification, and the auditor will cover your full management system, including all of your key processes and the relevant clauses of the standard. So half your key processes per year with specific items every year. Got it. Can you explain the key steps and processes involved in conducting an ISO surveillance audit? What are they looking for? Sure, sure. And as stated earlier, you know, the surveillance audits are typically shorter audits covering only a portion of your management system and your key processes. Your certification body auditor should be submitting an audit plan to you in advance of the scheduled audit, maybe approximately 30 days or so. So you should be able to see what processes and operational areas the auditor is planning to audit. Well, this also helps you prepare, I'm sure, and also to see which employees they may may need to speak to as part of the audit. Correct. Correct. And also the certification body should be reaching out to you prior to each audit to inquire about any changes to your management system or your organization. And they also want to obtain a current employee count. Now, again, when they reach out, it's probably different for every registration body. I'd say approximately 90 days or so they should be reaching out okay. to try to get that information. What do they count employees? Well, all this information goes into audit planning. And depending on the changes, it could have an impact on the length of your audit. Oh, okay. Because one of the primary factors for determining audit days is the number of employees that an organization has. Oh, okay. So the more employees you have, the more people there are to talk to and interview, so it increases the length of the audit. That makes sense. So if you have had an increase or decrease in the number of employees, the certification body will determine if that change will increase or potentially decrease the number of audit days that are going to be needed for that audit. That makes sense. Surveillance audit activities could also be impacted by previous audit results. So if there were a number of issues in a given process or area, the auditor may want to audit that process again at the following year's surveillance audit. But again, ultimately, the certification body and the auditor should be contacting the certified organization prior to each audit to obtain that necessary information to properly plan their surveillance audit activities. And we want to thank everyone who's listened to our podcast today. We hope it's been informative for you. And if you're looking for more information about Core Business Solutions and how we can help with your ISO certification, cybersecurity, or even customized training, please email us at info at thecoresolution.com. You can also visit our website at www.thecoresolution.com. And if you haven't already followed us on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube, be sure to do so, and that way you won't miss the next Quality Hub podcast once released next week. Have a great day, everyone.